Hi everyone, my name is Mark Kelly. I'm a junior doctor at Oxford and I'm currently in my general medical training with a plan to specialise in neurology in the future. For the last couple of years I've been doing work with OPDC looking at some of the current medications that we use for symptomatic treatment in Parkinson's and I've been particularly studying the side effects of those treatments and what impact those side effects might have on patients. So what I'm going to talk about today is a side effect known as impulse control behaviours which occurs with one of our medications called dopamine agonists. And this is really what it's all about. So this is dopamine, a molecule that's expressed throughout the brain with lots of different effects. And in Parkinson's, where people experience loss of neurons that produce dopamine, we get a range of motor and non-motor effects. To treat the symptoms of Parkinson's, therefore, it's quite simple. We just need to replace dopamine. But of course, as with any treatment in any disease, we always have to weigh up the difference between benefit of symptom, of symptom relief and the risks of adverse effects. So this is the treatment I'm going to talk about today. These are dopamine agonists that we use often in early Parkinson's, particularly when we don't want to start yet start people on levodopa. And the common ones are pramipexol, rapinirol, and to some extent retigotine, which is a patch that people wear. So how do they work? Well, dopamine agonists act by mimicking dopamine at receptors in the brain called D1, D2, and D3. These receptors have different effects depending on where they are in the brain. So for example, D1 and D2 are prim primarily found in a part of your brain called the dorsal striatum, which is the motor circuit of the brain. When you're lacking dopamine from this region, you experience things like tremor, stiffness and slowness, the symptoms of Parkinson's, and dopamine agonists by acting on these receptors help to relieve those symptoms. However, there's also a receptor called D3, which is primarily found in an area of the brain called the ventral striatum, or the reward circuit of the brain. And in this area, dopamine drives us to, it encourages behaviours that we find rewarding. So what happens when we stimulate there? If D1 and D2 gives us the benefit that we want of the medication, D3 can actually give us the risk. And it, it's believed that dopamine agus may prefer to select D3 over D1 and D2. So what is that risk? Well, we can get something called impulse control behaviours. And these are a problem in the self-control of emotion and behaviour. In their severe form, they're known as impulse control disorders. And these have quite strict definitions, but the key feature with all of them is that there's an impulsive behaviour that persists despite causing harm to the person or sometimes to people around them. Examples which you may have heard of quite a lot are people who tend to gamble more on their medications, compulsive shopping, binge eating or increases in sexual drive. And then there's some other ones called dopamine dysregulation, where people start to abuse their medications. Hobbyism, where they spend excessive amount of time on hobbies or interests. And punding, which is an excessive compulsive type side effect, where people repeat purposeless motor actions. So what do we know about these? Well, they've been extensively studied, and impulse control disorders are quite common, and may occur in as many as 15% of people with Parkinson's. However, the studies that have looked at this have only diagnosed people as either having a disorder or not having one. There's been very little focus on the severity of these behaviours and how much of an impact they're actually having. It also tends to ignore people who don't quite fit the criteria of a disorder, these strict diagnostic criteria, but may still be experiencing impact from their impulsive behaviours. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. For instance, is everybody with an impulse control behaviour going to be at this end of the spectrum? Probably not. Or is it the case, perhaps, that impulsivity isn't always a bad thing? And in OPDC, I've come across two study participants who were both artists and were both started on dopamine agonists when they were diagnosed with Parkinson's. And they did experience some impulsive behaviours, but one of the ways that this manifested was that they actually experienced an increase in their creative and artistic drive, producing some really beautiful pieces of artwork that they've allowed me to show to you today, which is very kind. And I think this is a great example of how we need to always keep an eye on this risk and benefit balance, because one of these participants did have to stop her medication because of other impulsive effects that she was experiencing, but one of them has been able to stay on it without any trouble.
So this is why it's not enough just to say that somebody is impulsive or somebody isn't. We need to, a method of grading that to see how much of an impact it's having. So we, two years ago, we set out with a study to examine, the, to try and answer some of these questions. First of all, we wanted to identify the prevalence of both impulsive, controls, Im impulsive control behaviours and their extreme form, impulse control disorders, in our early cohort of Parkinson's at OPDC. We would then grade the severity of those behaviours on a new scale that's been designed by Dr. David O'Kai at Oxford, a neuropsychiatrist, and this scale is called the PICS. It takes into account both the intensity of the behaviour, how much time you're spending on it, or perhaps how much money, and the impact, so how much of an effect it's actually having on your day-to-day -day life. One of the most important things about OPDC is that we're a longitudinal cohort, and that's important because Parkinson's is a chronic disease. So we need to see what happens to people over time. So now that we've identified some people with impulse control behaviours, we have the, op the opportunity to follow them up a year to two years later, which is what I've done recently, to see what happened with those behaviours over time. We didn't just carry out this study in Parkinson's, we also looked at people with REM sleep behaviour disorder and some of our healthy controls. Because impulsivity is a normal occurrence and it doesn't have to necessarily be due to dopamine agonists. The, obviously those medic medications increase the risk of it. So everybody who comes into the cohort, as many of you will be aware, answers a short questionnaire called the QUIP, which asks some very simple questions about whether you find yourself thinking about food more than you used to or spending more money than you intend to. And anybody who answers yes to any of those questions, of which there was 195 people with Parkinson's, or about 20% of the cohort, any of them we invited to an interview, usually over the phone, where we explored those symptoms in more detail. First of all, to determine if there was any true impulse control behaviour there, and then to grade its severity using the PICS that I showed you. And what we found was we interviewed 88 people with Parkinson's who had answered yes to one of those questions on the quip. Of them, just under half, 39, were experiencing true impulse control behaviours. 10 had a full diagnosis of disorder under those strict diagnostic criteria, but nearly three times that were still experiencing impulse control behaviours. And we class these people as subsyndromal. So they are experiencing behaviours but don't necessarily meet the criteria of a disorder. And we need to know what kind of an impact that's having. Interestingly, about half of these people who were subsyndromal had experienced a full impulse control disorder in the past and usually had it improved slightly with a change in medications, but hadn't gone away entirely. These are the type of behaviours as we see, I've described some of them already. Eating behaviours are by far the most common. After that we see people overspending, in increased interest in hobbies, and an increased uh, interest in sexual drive. Gambling is quite rare, and I think it's something that physicians tend to really look out for, because it's a known, very detrimental side effect of these medications. So once we graded these on the PICS, how bad are these behaviours? Well, the good news is that most people actually end up in this kind of m very mild end of the spectrum. This is where people are experiencing behaviours, but it's not really affecting their day-to-day -day life all that much. A select few are at the other end of the spectrum, and this usually requires quite urgent medical management. But then there's still a significant number of people who are falling somewhere in the middle. And the dark blue here shows that half of these people were actually classed as subsyndromal, not a syndrome with a full disorder. So this means these people don't meet the diagnostic criteria of a disorder, but clearly their behaviour is having some kind of impact on their day-to-day -day life. And this isn't something that's been described very often in the literature, so we wanted to know what's going to happen to these people over time, which is what we've done. So that, the first data I showed you was from two years ago. Now we followed people up a year to two years later, and those 39 participants have been re-interviewed to ask the same questions and grade their behaviours again. Of those, eight had previously had a disorder when we saw them at first, and the other 22 were subsyndromal, experiencing some level of these behaviours. We also re-interviewed a few RBD and healthy controls as well. So what happened to people when we saw them a second time? Did they get better or worse? Well, it was a little bit of both. Nine people instead of eight now had a full disorder, but these weren't necessarily the same people. But in quite a few people, the behaviours went away entirely, and then some stayed subsyndromal. So there's a lot of change going on in a very short amount of time. 
There's also a change in the type of behaviours that we saw. So some people who hadn't experienced gambling before at their first interview were now reporting some symptoms of gambling. So again, more change. But what about the change in severity? Because this is what's most important and this is why we designed this scale. Well, close to half of people actually showed some improvement between their first and their second interview. These behaviours weren't causing the same kind of impact that they used to. But a third of people, their behaviour seemed to be getting a bit worse and were causing more harm. And five people who at their first interview didn't meet the criteria of, of uh, impulse control disorder now met those criteria. So let's look at that in a bit more detail because that's important. So before the first interview, of those 30 who we've now seen twice, 16 had some form of impulse contr control disorder in the past. By the time they got to their first interview, half of those had improved but were still subsyndromal and half still met the diagnostic criteria. But then by, their sec by the second interview, half had improved again, some of them going away entirely, while some still persisted. And some people had been taken off their medications at this point, but it's still the disorder hadn't gone away completely. But these, these behaviours can get better. They can also come back though. So of these people who were subsyndromal, having had a disorder previously when we saw them at their first interview, numbers still continued to improve, but a couple of people were now reporting that their symptoms were starting to come back. And it wasn't a big change, but they were just starting to bother them a bit more than they used to. So, there's, so we saw people with, who had reported these behaviours two years ago, and one to two years later we saw them again. That's quite a short time frame in something like Parkinson's. But as you can see, there was lots of change. Change in the type of behaviours and the severity of the behaviours that we saw. So what's driving this? Because we know that medication drives impulsivity in Parkinson's. And if you have a, a severe impulse control behaviour, you can come off your dopamine agonist, and in the vast majority of cases, those symptoms will improve. But because we saw people so close together, actually, nobody came off their medications during this time between the two interviews. So that's not what it was down to. Had there been changes, I expect we would have seen them. But the 22 people who were on their dopamine agonist at interview one were still on them at interview two. And of these other people who weren't taking them, six of them had taken a dopamine agonist in the past but stopped it before the first interview. Most of them continued to improve when we saw them again, but a couple had said that their symptoms were starting to bother them again. So if it's not the type of medication that's changed, was it the dose? Because obviously doses tend to change every year or so. And the answer is yes, they do, but that didn't make the difference either. And that's something that's been shown in other studies as well. So impulse control disorders don't seem to be related to medication dose. Some people get them and some people don't, but it's not really down to how much of the medication you're taking. And obviously a lot of people between the two interviews increased their medication dose. A lot of these actually showed improvement in their impulsivity. And of those who had a reduction in dose, exactly the same number showed a, a, an increase and some of them did disimprove. So it's not down to that either. So if all this change is happening and it's not due to the medications, what's it due to? And the honest answer is um, we don't really know yet. This is a very small study with small numbers, but it's looking at impulse control behaviours in a lot more depth than most studies have before now. And it's not going to give us all the answers, but here's what we do know. We know that impulse control behaviours are common even in an early Parkinson's cohort like OPDC. And about 10% of, of the cohort have experienced these behaviours. A significant proportion of people will be at a subsyndromal level where they don't meet the criteria for a disorder, but it's having some kind of impact on their life. Also, the severity isn't fixed. So these behaviours change a lot and can vary in a very short amount of time. So I think the real learning fr point from that is that if people are on medications like this, we just need to monitor them quite closely. Because while my, now that scales might be in the favour of benefit, it can change very quickly and people could start being at risk of their medications. It also does seem that when people come off their medications, there's a very select number of people who are still at risk of impulsive control behaviours thereafter which means that there's some people who are more sensitive to these medications than others and we need to try and identify who they are. So these medications have been a long time but we're learning more about them all the time. And OPD, what OPDC offers us is this excellent opportunity to study these medications in a real life situation where people's doses are changing and where we can follow them up over time to see what happens down the line. And I think, so 
this study, like I said, has now looked at these behaviours in a lot more detail than people have previously. And it's opened up new doors for future studies to further examine the clinical importance of behaviours like these and try and identify people who are most at risk of impulse control disorders. The reason for that is the more we understand about these medications, the better we can direct therapies in the here and now, because these are medications already on the market. But not just that, because the more we learn about the way these medications work, the more we actually learn about Parkinson's and the other underlying pathological processes. And it's learning like that that's going to direct us towards new treatments. These are all the people who have worked to me in this study over the last couple of years. I'm very grateful to OPDC for the opportunity, but I'm most grateful to everybody who's taken part in the study up till now, because without them it wouldn't be possible. Thank you. That's a phenomenally excellent study that you've done, Mark. And uh, remember, Mark is a junior doctor who really has spent two lots of six months with us. So I'm really delighted with the data. I think.